I'm really thrilled to be introducing our next speaker, Dorothea Summer. Dorothea is Deputy Director General of the Bavarian State Library in Munich and has traveled a long way to be with us this week. Uh, she has a, distinguished, has a distinguished career in German libraries, but also within our library buildings and equipment group. Um, so to expand our global view of library buildings, Dorothy is going to give us an overview of recent developments in Germany. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dorothy. Um, yes, good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the hosts of um, this uh, really interesting and impressive program um, here in Sydney, um, and also um, all the libraries um, we, vis we could visit. Um, so we really had a reverse of impressions and I enjoyed very much my stay here in Australia. Um, it's my first time actually. So, but so I'm very pleased and delighted to have the opportunity um, here in Sydney to give you a brief snapshot on recent developments in German architecture. And I will point to some trends um, that apply to different building uh, designs, such as new library buildings, as well as buildings that are adjusted, newly trimmed and redesigned, as well as different types of libraries. Um, yeah, as we all know um, libraries and their design uh, still matter. Um, libraries are central spaces, both for the urban and research um, communities, as well as for the digital society. They provide at the same time storage and access for printed media and platforms for digital resources and the explorative use of digital services and tools. A particular challenge is the creation of specialized and individual learning spaces. The challenge is to develop intelligent and flexible concepts for library spaces as well as for virtual rooms that will work for an academic library, for research and teaching, for specialized libraries, as well as for public libraries. So um, here you see the institution I come from in Munich, in Bavaria. Um, we will turn to this um, at the very end um, of my presentation. Um, for the beginning, I would like to focus a bit on the status quo in Germany. Um, th there's a short framework within which library architecture is developed at present. Um, without a doubt, the COVID pandemic and for a good year now, the um, Ukraine war with the threat of energy shortages in Europe have led to inflation as well as high energy and building prices and severe supply difficulties. Building materials are actually traded now at daily prices and it has become very difficult to make calculations. So there is only, apart from that also, we have a demographic change to be observed um, and also a shortage of skilled workers. So that may be different in Australia, but that's the case in Germany now. Um, what concerns us all, I, I think, is the climate crisis that requires urgent action and also influences the way library buildings are planned and built today. The state of Bavaria, where I work, um, is therefore trying to respond to these difficult um, conditions with greater flexibility. On the one hand, attention is being paid to sustainability and the achievement of climate goals. And this goes hand in hand with the consideration on how to become as self-sufficient as possible in energy supply. As is well known, the UN 2030 um, sustainability goals um, and uh, the uh, German, uh, the, the Green Deals of the EU 2021 um, envisage having the CO2 emissions by 2030 and becoming climate neutral by 2045. And Bavaria has this goal to become climate neutral in 2040. In Germany, the construction industry contributed about 6% to the overall economic development in 2021, 
and head of the key sectors of mechanical engineering and chemicals. A major cost driver in construction is also standardization. And there are over 3,700 Dean standards for building in Germany, some of which even act as a barrier to buildings and restrict the freedom of planning for innovative processes and concepts. So the Bavarian Chamber of Architects therefore introduced a resolution at the federal level last year to enable the introduction of a new building type, which is called E. E stands for easy, for simple construction, for all building classes. In accordance with Mies van der Rohe, less, uh, his motto was less is more, the rules and the standards um, are to be reduced at an indispensable minimum. This means, however, that the protective goal of the building regulations, which exist separately in each federal state, are non-negotiable. Stability, fire protection, health and living conditions, and environmental protection. So the Federal Chamber of Architects has unanimously endorsed uh, this Bavarian initiative, and the Federal Chamber of Engineers um, has voted similarly. So let's come to the libraries. Many um, university libraries uh, in Germany, so I will start with the centralization with the academic sector, centralization of branch libraries and creation of campus libraries. Um, we have seen um, the um, a development within the last, let's say 20 years that um, many university libraries in Germany have invested um, considerable financial means into upgrading of their infrastructure in the building. Um, this includes in particular the library systems in rather large universities with a historically grown structure. So the respective buildings were originally spread throughout the cities rather than being concentrated in a campus situation. Library systems such as the Goethe Universität in Frankfurt, um, at the Freie Universität Berlin, at the University Library in Heidelberg, or the library system of the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich, meanwhile look back at very long-term centralization processes. And I have brought you the example of the Goethe uh, um, Universität in Frankfurt am Main, um, where we have really, yeah, a very large university library system. Um, here, there were about 150 libraries merged and transferred into a new library building alongside with the campus creations, according to the subjects. On the Western uh, campus, the new building of the Library for Linguistics and Cultural Studies, which you see here in the complex, uh, marks actually the completion of a campus development that began with the conversion of the famous Perzig building, um, formerly IG Farben, into a branch library for the humanities in 2001. Um, here you have the Perzig building. Um, it actually dates back to the beginning of the 1930s, and Hans Perzig implemented here his architectural principles of a new objectivity in an impressive manner. And the new buildings on this campus, of course, try to cite and refer to this original Perzig building. So um, since 2001, um, six, uh, no, five further branch libraries have been built on campus West End. And uh, the new library for uh, linguistics and cultural studies is located in a building complex um, that houses also the respective institutes, a lecture hall, a computer center, um, cafeteria, among other things, and it was financed from the Horeca funding program of the state of Hesse, under which more than 4.5 billion um, euros will flow into the financing of new university buildings and conversions until 2026. And altogether, this building um, cost about 123 million euros. So the library was opened in uh, 2022 after four years of construction, and it has a surface of about 20,000 square meters. Um, it was planned and executed by an architectural um, office based in Hamburg, 
and um, for the um, new building, um, you can see that um, you have the facades um, similar to, to the um, Hölzig building, but you also have a green roof. And um, with, that is really important for the uh, climate regulation in, in big cities. Um, so that's a main feature of, of this new Frankfurt uh, building. And actually this um, building exceeds the, um, uh, the standards, the legal standards um, for um, uh, the uh, um, sustainability. So um, I have come now to yeah, have an interior view and some figures. And I will now point to another example. We come now to the city of Hessen. Hessen is um, situated in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia. And um, here we have the Folkwang University, which was the building uh, was created by the architect Max Dudler. Max Dudler made his name um, with various library buildings in, in Germany and in the German speaking um, countries. Um, maybe you've uh, heard of the Grimm Zentrum in Berlin, and he is also currently building the um, Library of the Bundesrat. Um, he has built um, in 2012 um, the Folkwang University Library, and Folkwang has um, a name actually um, is synonymous for teaching, studying, and producing art um, for more than about 90 years and it is actually a, a central training center and the only one in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia for music, theater, dance, design and academic studies and it has been bringing various disciplines um, and art forms together under one roof since 2000, um, 1927 and um, this is all based on the Folkwang idea of an interdisciplinary cooperation between the arts. And so a famous, um, yeah, famous graduate of Folkwang University is the dancer and choreographer Pina Bausch, so quite famous in Germany. So Folkwang students um, can study at places and venues with special atmosphere, at, with a very special atmosphere. Um, such as the Baroque residence of a Benedictine Abbey or a representative bank building um, in the style of historicism or an award-winning building of the Sana architects. And of course, they can study in the library by um, Doodler. So the library building is here um, part of the Baroque Abbey complex and quotes in its lower parts of the facade, the rubble stones, of an ancient building as a relic. And um, you've seen at the beginning the uh, opaque and translucent glass facade. And uh, this uh, is reminiscent of yeah, natural stone um, in which is found in the surroundings. And in fact, the shell consists of digitally printed glass. Um, and uh, it shows the different motifs of this stone design. So um, in the structural design, uh, attention was also paid to the energy values um, in the division of the glass facade. The south facade has double insulating glass with solar protection by other sides have double glazing with thermal protection. So here you have again view on the glass and um, yeah, it is, um, Max Dudler, but, um, he constructs very geometric buildings. That's a, a special feature of him. And um, the idea of this building was actually that of a jewel box. So the outer shell protects the valuable in, inside core. Um, inside, um, you will also have a reading room with um, yeah, several spaces and all the furniture was also done by Doodle. So um, in this library, which is um, yeah, specialized in music, um, we, um, there are several collections merged, which were formally concentrated in various 
um, points in the city of Essen and, and the surroundings. Um, this building was awarded the architecture prize of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia in 2015. Um, next, I would like to show you an interesting example of a public library, which was completed in 2017. Um, it is a public library of the town of Heidenheim in the state Baden-Württemberg. Again, it is a building designed by Doodler. In 2019, it was awarded the International Architecture Award of the Athenaeum Chicago, the Museum of Architecture and Design. It also received a recognition at the German Architecture Award. The new building was constructed on a former prison site at the interface between the historic city center and on the other hand, so a region with a post-war development. So as a structural link, the library building um, has the task of mediating between these two parts of the city. And the structure itself is over 110 meters long and houses an integrative coffee and event hall. Um, a media center open to the public, and of course, um, the Heidenheim City Archive and the library. And it, in its contours, it actually re resembles a city facade with some smaller houses. So um, you see also the sand colored facade. Um, this is also um, a quote, um, or yeah. It, uh, it is related actually to Hellenstein Castle, which is also seen on, on the picture above. That's an old Stauffer Castle dating back of, to the 12th century um, that rises above the town. So uh, the library is thus designed as an identity forming public space. So inside um, uh, the multifunctional building, it is executed uh, to a topology of lane, square, and promenade. And the library is situated in the second floor. It has elevated reading rooms that alternate with low cabinets. And the varied sequence of space can be experienced at a glance um, via the internal promenade that runs really the entire length of the building and that connects all five reading rooms and it has also two roof terraces cut into the building volume, which invite readers to read outside if the weather is fine. In Germany, the weather can be quite cold in winter, but in summer you can go out. So all furnitures were also designed by Max Doodler. And addition, in addition to the predominant white um, and honey colored oak veneer, um, uh, you, you can also see the, the work tables um, with natural light um, and um, furniture. So here are some figures for, for this library on some building information. And now I come to a small library, but it is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site that played a special room uh, played a special role in, in the year 2007, 2017 because of the anniversary of the Reformation. It is Wittenberg Castle, built in 1489, located in the immediate vicinity of the castle church, where Martin Luther is said to have posted his 95 theses. And some of you will know Wittenberg as a place where Shakespeare's fictive hero Hamlet has studied. So to mark the 500 years an, uh, of anniversary of the Reformation, which was really a big event in Germany, uh, Wittenberg Castle, of which um, of course only remnants remained, was extensively renovated and extended. And um, this was done by an architectural office, um, which is situated in Berlin. And it has received the German uh, Architecture Award 2019, for its achievement and the castle was also on the long list for the Mies van der Rohe Award for European Architecture. So the lead architect is a Bauhaus University, um, Bauhaus University professor. And um, you can see here um, that the 
it is a form of fortress, you have indeed um, walls that are about four meters thick. And uh, yeah, and it was quite difficult to connect um, the different levels um, within this fortress um, to, um, and so they had to um, install a new staircase and inside um, also the, the rooms are not very high and, and you have not really high shelving, but uh, it, um, it is really a library um, done in a very historic uh, setting um, and it contains very precious imprints and almost all of Martin Luther's writings in first editions. Um, I would like to come now to a library project which I have been involved um, since 2016 by now. Um, we come now to the state of Bavaria, to the city of Augsburg. The Augsburg um, City and State Library is one of the 10 regional libraries that are subordinate to the Bavarian State Library. And um, Augsburg City Library is actually one of the oldest German civil li uh, civic libraries. It was founded in 1537 during the Reformation, and it will soon receive an extension. So at present, it is actually housed in a veritable 19th century palace of books. And like many um, 19th century libraries, its viability um, in the 21st century was in doubt um, as costs of maintenance and renewal escalated and the role of the library was questioned. So now planning and construction is underway for the uh, building's renovation and extension to ensure the preservation and appropriate um, presentation of the valuable collections of, uh, of this library. And um, I must say the task of renewal has really many aspects. Um, on the one hand side, um, it is to ensure that the building meets current standards uh, for public buildings regarding accessibility, fire protection and energy uh, output. And on the other hand, the listed building must also meet the requirements of monument protection, uh, which may, for example, include the restoration of the historical ceilings and paintings of the Similia rooms. So um, furthermore, this library of course needs additional uh, storage space and all this had to be in, taken into consideration. And um, yeah, in 2016, the state of Bavaria tended an, uh, tended an architect architectural competition for the renovation and extension and um, yeah, it was, um, you, you can see the, the model of it. Um, and it is, of course, going to be a new doodler building. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, you see, there will be comp comparatively um, few uh, changes made to, ex to the existing building, but there will be um, a, a new um, building um adjusted uh, to it and um we are now um through a planning phase that um had more than 70 regular meetings um and uh we are in the situation now that the library had to move out of the building the total of the library into a new interim building which was a building site anew and um this will open in april and now the construction on the site uh, will start. And yeah, so here you can see some sketches of that. This is the new entrance on the building at the, at the back. And in uh, connection with the ongoing construction work, I would like to report to on, on a development that shows how the idea of sustainability in the form of building material um, and recycling this um, plays a, a special role in this project. Um, so we do have, this is also the planned interior, we do have an 
a building adjacent to, to the old building, which belongs back to the 1950s. And um, according um, to the new plans, um, this building had to be pulled down. So that's um, the building of the 1950s. Just, yeah, not very imaginative and creative. Um, and uh, so these architecture students um, from the University of Applied um, Sciences in Augsburg and the Augsburg um, building authorities carried out a transfer project. And this is called um, Architecture in the Cycle. And it deals um, with um, reusing um, materials, building materials from a demolished building. So, um, the students in this master's program registered and digitized uh, building components in the winter semester of 2021. You can also read this. So this is what they did <clears throat> here as well. It was quite a lot of work. And um, then they also yeah, used um, components to create also a design for the supplementary building of their uh, building, but um, they also sold things um, to, to the publics, which was not um, so, so easy. So um, they, um, the students and as well as the Augsburg building authorities were working closely together with a German startup um, company to register these um, building components. And that is called Concular. It is a pioneer in the field of building materials, um, registration, provision, and brokerage of, and it's now the largest marketplace for circular building components in Europe. So um, in Augsburg, um, yeah, they registered the, it took about six to 12 months um, to, to register these things. And um, as a result, 288 components found actually a second life in this way. And um, around 80 tons of CO2 were saved. And behind every component, um, there is a story that you can actually listen to. I can't tell you all the stories today, um, but um, there's one case when a family from um, Bavaria just um, screws the fire escape of the building in Augsburg and transported that back to their farm. And um, now they can reuse it and, and they are really glad that they um, can take it. So. Um, and also they um, use the fabrics um, of, of the curtains in the library and sew new um, yeah, bags of them. So that's just, just an example how, how they dealt with things in a very imaginative way. So um, that there's also a bit of a philosophy behind it. And uh, the project manager um, stated, it is actually about moving away from an expensive to a reductive modernity. And um, this critically really questions our comfort demands, um, our urge to renew and our idea of aesthetics. So we're all very excited about this uh, further progress of the interesting construction uh, project in Augsburg, um, which at the same time presents really very many challenges um, to us. So now I come back to uh, my, my library, the uh, Bavarian State Library. It is uh, Germany's largest universal library situated in a listed building dating back to the year 1832. And its architect Friedrich von Gärtner has designed here um, one of the largest bare brick buildings in Germany. And originally it was the court library of the Bavarian Kings um, and it was executed in a style of a Renaissance palace. So um, the building was partly destroyed during the second world war and it received an extension in 1966. And here you have a look at our great reading room. We have a range of reading rooms, but this is the large general reading room. And um, yeah, the, the new reading room is actually in some sort of contrast to the facade um, of Gärtner's building. Um, but uh, however, the transition um, between the old and the new building is hardly noticeable when you move within. So um, you can perhaps imagine that the um, 
requirements for, for the ongoing maintenance of the building, as well as the ever necessary modernization of the facility is like a cathedral construction site that never ends. So um, there are some points which are um, of special um, concern to us. Um, that is, um, yeah, furnishing of reading rooms and spaces. Um, we try to improve our research um, um, environment um, for manuscripts. Um, we have very precious manuscripts in Canabla collections. Um, we we do improve uh, our office spaces. Um, yeah, and um, storage is still an ongoing problem because we still collect every year about 130,000 printed and physical items. So, um, so here you have a view of the um, renovated um, uh, yeah, reading room for East European Oriental and Asian um, studies. Um, when we did this, um, we um, also um, yeah, thought of, of colors, of course, um, and, um, and fabrics. And we also tried to insert um, a, a space um, which is um, rather situated in, in the ground when you enter the building, um, which allows for more um, yeah, uh, leisurely uh, reading and so on. But it, um, the fabrics is, uh, that are used here um, consist of um, felt and um, we also use wood. You can see this also in the cafeteria. Um, this was recently redesigned by two young architects um, and uh, they really had difficulties because we had uh, have these strict forms in, in the buildings and these very expensive materials. So they have the marble columns and so on and they wanted to add something new. And at the same time, they wanted uh, yeah, to, um, to create a reference to, to the surroundings. And so perhaps, you know, Bavaria is famous for beer gardens and so on. So you see also the, the wood here and, and the leather cushions um, that they um, tried when they developed um, the, the furniture here. Um, we also, um, yeah, cite our surroundings. Um, you may have heard of um, Neuschwanstein and Hohenschwangau. So when you come to our meeting rooms, um, you will um, also have a look um, at um, yeah, photos like this. Um, when I go back to the um, cafe, you see here on, on top also um, a cartographic frieze, um, which was created by the artist Kaspar Andreasen in which historical maps um, and plans of the city of Munich from holdings of the Bavarian State Hold uh, um, of the Bavarian State Library um, were integrated. So these are the Bavarians. <laughs> and now I come to another aspect um, that constantly occupies the library. Um, and that is um, storage. Um, we are the Central Archive Library and Deposit Library of the Free State of Bavaria. And so we are in constant need of storage. And um, yeah, we have um, two stack um, libraries outside Munich, uh, meanwhile. And we have actually rented the, the last uh, stack building. And um, this, um, took place in 2015. And when we did this, um, the energy costs were not yet as high as they are now. Um, but we do have an investor now and, and, and he will install, I mean, he, he is about to install the, a photovoltaic system on this site. And um, this will be, is going to be finished um, already in July. So, um, that um, we will really um, have an answer to this constantly rising electricity prices on that side. So that's um, important to us at the moment. And we also hope that this new stack facility will achieve the, the status of a green building. Well, 
I think, just a slight summary what, of what you have seen in terms of the time. So, but you see what's in the future. In the future, we have the Augsburg Library and, of course, other interesting refurbishings within our library in Bavaria to be done. So I hope you got some, some impressions about what is going on in Germany. Thank you so much, Dorothea, um, for so, showing us some absolutely gorgeous German libraries, but with such thoughtful analysis of the challenges and the developments. Um, I know I want to go and see them, and I'm sure you do too. Um, just before I introduce our next speaker, could I please alert you to our IFLA Library Building's Twitter tag, hashtag, hashtag IFLA Build 2023, so I-F-L-A-B-U-I-L-D 2023. Um, and you'll see our marvellous information coordinator, Carl, has um, been tweeting to that, or maybe it's you, Kat, but we have wonderful people here who are promoting what's happening today. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Foster Zhang. Foster is... Um, the unit librarian at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, so Foster's going to be talking to us about um, recent developments in China uh, with Chris Hardy from Schmidt Hammer Larsen and Perkins and Will, who's presenting a video on libraries and transformation, Shanghai Library Lee, Shanghai Library East, as a video within this joint presentation. So uh, please welcome Foster in person along with Chris Hardy. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, this is my uh, first time in uh, Sydney as well. And, uh, so glad to be here and uh, have the opportunity to exchange uh, information with you guys. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Chris Hardy is uh, present with me uh, for this presentation. So my topic will be library building developments in China. So, um, you know, library is such a big country. And now I guess everybody's asking what's going on in China. It's just uh, many different things happening. So I can only talk about libraries, okay? but it's, it's connected. So a little bit about my organization, I joined this uh, university, it's brand new. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, um, uh, how to say it, it's a uh, um, brand, brand new campus, it opened the door in last September. So it's like less than one year old. Um, I guess the Chinese government is spending like 100 billion IMB for the campus. And uh, uh, they finish this whole thing from the ground to finish in uh, within two years. So 60 buildings include the library. So everything is rushed. Okay, so with this new university, we have uh, we had a little bit uh, different things that uh, you can see from the left top side of the circle is the old traditional Hong Kong University of Science Technology in Hong Kong. And the left half, half circle is uh, our new campus called Guangdong, uh, Guangzhou campus. And uh, so we said these two campuses is com complementary, complementary to each other's. Why do we say that? Because uh, you see from the left side, these traditional universities who have uh, department, have schools, you know, it's all uh, very uh, clear uh, dividing subject area for teaching and research. And there's a little bit of green things uh, we call uh, IPO with the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary program office. What we try to do is when Hong Kong UST uh, established in 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we try to encourage students to go into the interdisciplinary studies. Okay, so we, we, we thought we, we set up this office, try to help students to study, to take courses in other departments, but in, uh, it doesn't work very well. Because professors are in their own department, it's their own agenda, degree requirements. So um, it doesn't work, it just doesn't work very well. So um, for the new campus, we decided to totally forget about the school's department. We set up a full hubs. So you can see uh, 
the society hub, system hubs, information hubs, function hubs. And so when we can still come to the campus, we give them like one or two months to find out what they really want to do. Then we'll help them to pick up their own majors, their own uh, study directions. So this way they could end up with thousands and thousands of degree programs. Okay, so it's totally different uh, structure for the, for the education. So let's bring to a problem for my library. Uh, how can we to help them to accomplish this type of teaching or, or innovation in education? So that's something I'm not going to talk today. It's, uh, it's another total topic. Just bring me uh, uh, new issues with my space. How do I plan in my space? So I'm not going to talk about this um, in details because uh, it's not it's un, it's unfinished. The the library when I received it, uh, it's almost ten months. We still not passed the acceptance uh, test. It's, it's work leaking, electricity problems, air conditioning, all the stuff. I'm not I'm not going to talk about stuff. Okay. But I will give, give you a, a general picture of uh, what's going on for the academic libraries. Actually, my presentation, together with Chris, we, we talk three different types of libraries, academic libraries, children libraries, and uh, public libraries, okay. So for the academic libraries, just the pictures, we have, uh, we just recently started to uh, collect information for uh, every university library in China. So uh, two years ago, we got, uh, 1,255 university libraries says they have uh, buildings, okay? So um, the top five libraries that have the largest library building space was uh, Shandong universities because uh, uh, the area has a lot of population with only one university in that city. So they got like, uh, gosh, um, 13, 130,000 square feet. For the, for the library is huge. So the next one is uh, Sun Yixian University in, Guang, in Guangzhou. It's a famous old library, I mean, old, old, old university. So Sun Yixian is the name of the father of uh, Republic of China. So uh, he, he did go the same to revolution, to making China goes to modernization uh, race. So the other one is South China Normal University and the Jilin University and the Xiamen University. So they all is top five. Um, big libraries. So another thing is that uh, sometimes the space is associated with the citizen population. The MOE, Ministry of Education, has, has decided um, the library has to provide seating for one fourth of the citizen population. So the, that's associated with the calculation space. Just last year, uh, 2021, sorry, two years ago, uh, we will collect, we find out 214 university libraries building a new library. So it's like 200 new university libraries is going on, it's, it's under construction. Um, so the average library building space size for that new project is uh, 20,000 square feet. Um, also, this is average. So the largest is uh, uh, 100, uh, yeah, 10,000. 10, 100,000 and 102,000 square meters for the library of Oceana University of China. So it's also in the last year, we have another biggest uh, library is building up. So um, the average uh, square meter of the library building space is kept uh, 20,000 since 2006. So the average space is there, stay uh, consistent. So I, I saw that if you are uh, number one, that's finished.
Okay, so uh, the reason I pick this universe, I think, is the one mostly close to the standards we, we want to have uh, for academic libraries. Um, they get you get uh, full funding by the city government, and I think just uh, you, you saw the sto uh, automatic storage retrieval systems. Just for that project, they spend uh, one billion MB just for that project. So it's it's very rare in China we have that amount of money to support doing that things. Uh, just a little bit details about the library. So you see on the left picture, uh, you see this hallway outside of the building. I think it's very good design because Shenzhen is a, a southern city in China. It's very hot during the summer. So they, they create this uh, space around the inside, inside space. So the light can still come in to the, to the area, but the hot, wet, hot temperature is stopped by the surrounding area. So it will not make inside very, very cold. You know, when you have a uh, regular air conditioning, some, some area is very hot, some area is too cold. But by this design, uh, they get temp very comfortable temperature inside of the reading space. And also the, the, um, you know, the, the lights can come into the space. So I think it's good for the design. Uh, and the rest is just like we see in a Western US, in other countries, uh, you have a, a group discussion areas. So this library has much less um, shelf space because they're using the storage, automatic storage systems. They can give more space to, uh, to use it to use. Yeah, it's just outside of the building. It's huge, also huge libraries. I, I think they have uh, 2,000 seats for, for students. Okay, let, let, let's switch to another library, children library. Um, okay, um, the reason I knew this project is because this library is very close to my, um, my mom's home. So I went there two or three times, took lots of pictures, put on Facebook. And uh, um, the first time I went to the library, I was not allowed to come in because I didn't bring any children with me. <laughs> but it's good, you know, right? Anyway, uh, so the director of uh, uh, Lu Qing, uh, Lu Qing, Lu Qing, Lu Qing, um, see, see it's very, very nice writing notes for me. So I have to read his, uh, her notes. He, he really do a lot of research, put lots of thinking into this project. So uh, I, I really appreciate uh, his help. Okay, so. Uh, Shanghai Children's Library was founded in 1940 by uh, Sun Yixian's wife, the, the father of the Imperial China. Uh, so, um, um, so, so it's very old. And this is a new branch uh, was, was built in uh, 2018, uh, starting and finished the, uh, almost finished in two years ago. So the, the architect, architect is uh, Mr. Yang Lai Yun. A total Chinese guy. It's not a uh, foreigner, not famous. Uh, very, uh, you know, it's it's, it's a home growing architect. But he did a very uh, good job, I, I believe. You can see the picture later on. And he won a Shanghai Magnolia Award for, for this design. So the library is located in a very nice area. You can see there's a water in front. Is uh, we call the uh, Suzhou River, which is mother river for Shanghai. Uh, so it's in very, very good location. And uh, um, so um, the new main building comes of an uh, uh, area of uh, 6,000 something square meter with totally floor space of uh, 14,000 square meter. So it's lots of space. So it's, it's on your road to have a children lab by itself. It's because historical reason in 1940, so the Madame Sun set up the library. So we continue this. In China, like, like the rest of the uh, world, the public libraries, uh, children library section is, is part of public library, not, not separate, but this one is a uh, totally independent uh, children library. So um, um, let me see. Um, so, so the library, the uh, uh, format, the space, the science functions, um, According to the uh, the literature development, so I think it's very good for the 
goes to first floor, you have a youngest, then it goes to a fourth floor, you have a teenager space. So it's, it's we, the, the high level of uh, floor is this high uh, age of the children. So I think that's uh, um, also a considerable des design. So there's three reading rooms uh, for different age of group. Implies growth from uh, infancy to uh, adulthood and from the earth to the sky in just the, the uh, description. For example, early learning is soon on the second floor aims to provide early childhood education service for babies, toddlers, preschools, and their parents and uh, caregivers. So um, they have uh, two special space on this floor, namely chosen uh, childhood archives and uh, uh, this next one. Um, STEAMs, science, technology, engineering. This on the, uh, you can see the English little bit was there. So repeatedly set up with the contents, with the layout, with furniture, uh, reflected uh, reflection. Um, so uh, they also have a very uh, good uh, international chosen book collection. That's really surprising. I saw lots of American published child books, um, European other countries, even Africa. So I, I think even the, for the early age reading for, for kids to understand the, the world is uh, this whole piece together, not just Chinese, not just foreigners, it's all uh, the same, uh, same global thing. So you see the, um, the design is, another thing I have to mention, in China, the government always thinking library just part of the, office building or classroom building, they never thinking about special needs. Uh, so when we're asking for design for internally or functions, you know, no, 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 we don't give you money. We just buy your furniture, so you buy your own stuff. But this one is exceptional. You can see the, uh, everything is uh, integrated together. So the library has, has this uh, motto that um, children library holds all for children for all children. And uh, um, with this new uh, addition to the uh, children's library, and uh, um, it will meet the goal of uh, cultivating children's interests in learning, exploring, and imaginations. So I really think it's a very good example to introduce to our um, audience. So next one will be, um, so I, I really like point out, I really like this one because uh, even when children go into the libraries outside of the, you know, the installation, making them start to have fun to, you know, play with all this uh, um, child uh, children book uh, format. So I took the picture with the kids without permission of their parents. I didn't find their parents. I can't. I, I could not find their parents. Anyway, so I let, so I think I switch to next topics. So it's a recorded, recorded video for 17 minutes. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Hardy and I have been an architect for over 20 years and I love libraries. I have spent a decade practicing in the West and over a decade in the East. And in that time, our studio has designed more than 30 libraries around the world. So today I'm going to talk about libraries in transformation and finish by showing you our most recent project, Shanghai Library East. And as a practice, we are drawn to cultural projects and in particular libraries. And we have worked on library projects around the world and have always been fascinated by the way a library can benefit a community by giving it identity and creating space for them to come together. So why do we think this? For us, libraries are transcendent. They are going beyond what society associates them to be. Libraries have become social hubs, of course, and interestingly, they are becoming the hub that is transforming the most. Buildings as social hubs have been part of our civilization for centuries. Sport and competition has always brought us together. Studying art and artifacts in museums allows us to share our experiences. The historic caravan Sarai's combined places to exchange goods, and of course to connect, and libraries facilitated the exchange of knowledge. And all these spaces have evolved, but which one is evolving the most? 
For us, it is the library. These hubs all exist in different ways in our cities and they feed off local context and culture. However, libraries are beginning to bring all of these elements together as one. We refer to the current state as Library 4.0, and we are already thinking about Library 5.0. Library 1.0 was a curated collection of resources or writings. 2.0 then developed to incorporate technology. Library 3.0, we begin to realize this social aspect and the importance of people. And 4.0, we are introducing new functions that stimulate and support this socially driven curation of programs. Library 5.0 becomes about the integration of nature, reconnecting with our surroundings. And it takes us full circle to when scholars would meet in traditional gardens to discuss and share. Of course, the Roman philosopher Cicero once famously wrote, if I have a library in a garden, I have everything I need. And these spaces we create are, in fact, more about curating relationships. And libraries curate our relationship with people and place as we consume knowledge, entertainment and experience. We are strengthening the relationship with everyone around us. Here in our Ningbo Library project, the spatial layout of the library is driven by space for social interaction. And libraries provide what we call cultural refuge. They are a representation of us. They're a container for the things that define us and make sense of our place in the world. Our Christchurch Library in New Zealand, shown here, was the first public building built in the downtown after the city was devastated by the earthquakes. Libraries play an important role in civic empowerment. These spaces do this by providing open access and opportunities outside of the formal paths of education, because as a society, no one should be left behind. This is our Doc One Library in Aarhus where the combination of a hyper-flexible space and a feeling of community makes a library the perfect backdrop for a public government debate. And libraries ultimately have the potential to elevate individuals as well as societies. And at best, they do that by appealing to all facets of our lives. This is a wedding ceremony taking place in our Halifax Central Library in Nova Scotia, Canada. And our libraries are focused on the, the fundamentals of being human individuals and as a collective. Libraries are true public spaces and they are made for us. Now there are many topics that preoccupy our thinking about libraries and I want to touch on three topics that are part of the strategies we use and frequently discuss and these are some of the approaches we think are fundamental to the transformation of libraries and the first is, is this phrase, collection to connection. The focus of a library will become less focused on the collection it holds and increasingly more on its ability to bring people together. And the first library our studio ever designed well over 20 years ago now, the Royal Library in Copenhagen, known as the Black Diamond, it started from that very premise of connection. How, how could a library become a catalyst to reconnect both with the city, but to bring people together? And it did this in a very direct way by opening itself to the city and revitalizing the former dock area of Copenhagen. And for us, libraries, they need a point of focus. They need spatial moves that focus on bringing us all together and uniting us with our context and our community. And in Halifax, Nova Scotia, we did this in a number of ways. Firstly, the, with the idea of co-creation. So if we were creating something for the community, then the community should be involved in its creation. And the design was the result of intensive public consultation, six large meetings of 300 plus people over six months. And the outcome sort of reaffirmed our belief in this idea of connection. And the spaces created were what the community asked for. They wanted the architecture and the space to celebrate their desire to be together and that the library as a building would do this. The next way of thinking that preoccupies us is the concept of openness and transparency and the idea spatially of a library as a, an open marketplace. And in 2006, when we completed this city library in Halmstead, Sweden, it was placed in a city park and the project curved and engaged with the park itself, as well as even expanding out into the river, becoming physically engaged with the heart of the city. But the organization was thought of 
as a singular open marketplace. Uh, a covered urban square that was free of division and hierarchy and open to all. And this allowed visitors to connect not only with each other, but also with the combination of nature and urban life that surrounded them. And the relevance of this approach is applicable in many contexts. Here in Ningbo, China, one of the largest port cities in China, the library was essentially a catalyst for a newly developed part of the city. And like Halmstead Library, the defining organization was all about openness and transparency. So placing the most popular collections, exhibitions and resources on a single floor and allowing visitors to explore and enjoy the serendipity of that chance encounter or experience. And from the open marketplace, the central space that brings people up through the building is seen as a book stack for people. And this space becomes a container for people rather than a container for books sort of collecting and connecting visitors as they enjoy solitude, but also connection. And despite what many believe post pandemic, as people and human beings, we want to be together. It's in our DNA. And the final topic we often talk about is cultural representation, how the symbolism of a library can help in highlighting its importance in a community. And at Doc One in Aarhus, uh, representing the culture of the city is combined with reaching out to the world beyond the city. So from a local cultural perspective, the library becomes that hub for gatherings and celebrations as a collective. And likewise, it's a contemplative and personal reconnection with your own city. Now, through artistic representations of the growth of the community, through even the birth of a child, where the art installation entitled Gong becomes like a clock that chimes every time a baby is born in Aarhus, allowing new parents this direct connection with their community at such a life-changing moment in their lives. And when you take this idea to other parts of the world and other cultures, this topic of cultural representation is of course just as relevant. So here in Christchurch, New Zealand, we designed the new library there as a marker for the rebirth of the city and the community. And through discussion with the community, we began to understand their cultural representation the importance of cultural references such as the Pataka, a storehouse used in Maori culture that protected valuable possessions, understanding the Tamoka or Maori tattoo, the connection with the landscape that surrounds the city, and of course the desire to reconnect with a brighter future from a city devastated by the earthquake. And all these things became a representation of what the library should be, the Pataka being raised up to protect the knowledge, the colour and pattern of the grasslands, the Maori tattoo showing commitment and respect, and finally using the library as a tool to view and connect with your city. So this brings us to Shanghai and the new Shanghai Library East. So how have these ideas of cultural representation, open marketplace and collection to connection manifested themselves here? So to, to briefly set the scene, as you can see from this list of the top 10 libraries in the world in terms of their collection, you can see, see Shanghai Library is the third largest in the world after the British Library and the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And this is the existing Shanghai Library and at 84,000 square meters, it's a substantial building. However, the intriguing thing about this project is only 20% of this library is open to the public. The upper floors and the two towers that you see are physical storage for books and are non-accessible. So as the library of the future becomes less about storing books, but more about offering services and spaces for people, you could argue that this model is no longer appropriate. So therefore, the new Shanghai Library East in Pudong, which will partner with the existing library in Puxi with one of the world's largest collections, is freed up from this physical requirement. So 80% of this library will be accessible to the public. So it's almost a perfect yin-yang library partnership one library built in the age of physical information and another looking to the future of connection and people. So we were extremely lucky to have such a privileged site for this new library. It's right on the edge of Shanghai's largest park. And this sort of urban scale garden was essentially our first uh, reference. And at the beginning of the project, we spent a lot of time in the park and it's an extremely popular park. And it's like a Chinese garden, but basically on a much bigger and more urban uh, scale. And although it's a modern park, it was designed as a modern interpretation of a, a traditional Chinese garden. We began to look at the history of traditional gardens and 
you can sort of see the similarities there all defined by their man-made circumstance, often in urban surroundings, and they all use the same elements. So these defining features of rocks, pathways, water, and pavilions were, were very consistent. And also this idea of the solitary pavilion among the green and nature was something we also felt was symbolic and recognizable and linking to this idea of Library 5.0. However, the one that had the most meaning for what a library was historically, and where we thought it was going in the future were scholars walks and scholars walks were considered a point of focus in the garden and they were places where scholars would gather to discuss the issues of the day and to share ideas so this was our starting point for the meaning of a library a point of focus a place that drew people together to share ideas and the library would float above the trees and represent a rock in an urban scale chinese garden so this is one of our early architectural models showing the, the idea of a floating rock. And as the design became more refined, the horizontal lines representing the strata of a rock became the ultimate expression. And here, the library complete, as you see it today, a, a new contemporary scholar's rock floating in Shanghai's largest urban garden. And then at night, the perception of a rock as being solid is reversed. The interior becomes illuminated exposing this city living room to the people of the city. And then for the interior of the library, we revisited the idea of the scholar's rock and how scholars would get inspiration from their strange forms and openings, which would seem, seem to sort of shift as you walked around from different angles. And this became the idea of the atrium, a, a warm enclosed vessel that would be a place to focus inward and frame the variety of library spaces. So this is how the stepped atria space was, was born. Um, this was halfway through construction. And then here, the, the space complete. And you, you can sort of see uh, this trio of spaces overlapping and the series of openings exposing the movements and spaces across the library. And the main arrival moment is marked by one of 10 artworks that visitors will experience as they move around the library. This piece on the floor is by Shanghainese artist Shen Fan entitled Passing of the Seasons. And, and this artwork continues from Shen Fan's original work, Punctuation Landscape, where punctuation marks and word spacing reflects the emotion in language structures. So punctuation marks made text and especially Chinese text easier to read and understand to the general public. And it plays an important role in the dissemination of knowledge. And the text selected for the piece have significant meaning and relevance to Shanghai and to the library. And as you move up through the space, the openings begin to frame the activities in different levels. The intention of this is to encourage exploration and discovery. And the space is wrapped in bamboo that allows us to deal with the acoustics and ventilation that allowing the space to remain clean and calm and have a sort of natural uh, material texture. And then in this diagram, you can see beyond this central space, there are four reading rooms on every side of the library facing in every direction two facing the city and two facing the park. And these spaces become about connecting you to your context and your city, giving users the chance to read, relax and meet with the backdrop of the trees and nature. And in this space, art continues to make an important link to place with Chinese and international artist Xu Bing's art, uh, artwork, an installation called Living Word. And Xu Bing, organizes the letters of an English word, bird, uh, into structures that resemble Chinese characters. So it allows non-Chinese speakers to understand how Chinese characters are composed. And the artwork rises from a book in the center of a reading table, progressing from English print to calligraphy to Chinese pictographs. And the characters fly up from the book and around the columns towards the atrium window and the park beyond. So an analogy of the elevation of a reader's mind after opening a book. And then another example of art here in the Children's Library um, with its own artistic intervention by Australian artist Emily Floyd entitled Butterfly Kites. And these were inspired by Shanghai's history and reputation for traditional graphic novels. And the butterfly kite is a recurring motif in these novels. So the material palette we use in the library is deliberately subtle and quiet and creating a calm backdrop for the activities, the programs and the movement of people. But we also play with colour, using bold, simple 
moments of color to emphasize programs and define the spaces. So the interior of these spaces, such as program and music rooms, are lined in bold fabrics, emphasizing a moment of focus and concentration on a topic or an event. So this is Shanghai Library East, a scholar's rock in an urban Chinese garden, a point of focus and a place to come together. So as a moment to end, this is my family and we have lived in, in Shanghai for over a decade now. And in fact, my two children were born here in Shanghai. So this is their home too. So for the first time in my um, career, I've designed a library that also not only the public, but my family can also become a part of. So thank you, enjoy the rest of your conference and thank you for listening. Wow, thank you, Foster, and thank you, don't go away too far. Thank you, Foster, and thank you, Chris. Uh, we've seen some amazing libraries in your presentation. Um, I love Chris's concept of containers for people. Um, we will pass on our thanks to Chris on behalf of you all after the event. But Foster, I would very much like to thank you on behalf of everyone here again, like Dorothea, for traveling so far and coming to Sydney for the first time to share your um, expansive knowledge of um, libraries in China and to give us such an amazing overview. I think it would be fair to say we're all blown away by the scope of the projects that you've showcased from China. So thank you very much. Um, before we break for lunch, we've got um, a few moments um, for a couple of questions. So if you would like to think about your questions while I invite Dorothea and Foster to come back up the front, please. Thank you. So I've got, I've got a I've got a question um, I've got a question for you, Dorothea. Um, I was interested to hear that um, there seems to be lots of issues with with actually the the materials and getting the materials in Germany at the moment. It sounds like it's a bit of a worldwide phenomenon. I know we're struggling with building projects here and materials. How much impact do you think that's having on? on library projects? Um, yes, I, I think that will have a, an impact uh, on library projects, on, on any building projects. Um, I, I hope that um, uh, it, the situation will improve, um, but um, I think um, that the um, financing might uh, rise if you do not get the uh, materials just in time. And, um, and also the, the lengths um, of, of construction time so and that has really is, is really a major impact that can occur yeah it's fascinating because what we find in getting together in our ifla groups is the commonality of of problems around the world um and they just seem to be um finding some a lot a lot of the same issues and um have we got any other questions from the floor please yes Hello. I'm just really interested from both of you that I noticed that all of your libraries are still have a huge focus on print collections and particularly from academic libraries, we're stripping out our print collections. Uh, some libraries just recently got four floors of no collection and consolidated into a small ground floor. So is that because your collections are historically significant or are your users still really uh, using those print collections or is it a storage space with the people around it? Um, I mean, the uh, collection of, of the Bavarian State Libraries date back to 1558. And um, so that's a grown collection and we, we still, um, yeah, buy and, um, and, and get lots of physical items from all around the world, not just in Germany. So we obtain books from all over the world. And um, at the same time, uh, maybe I have not stressed that so much, but at the same time, the Bavarian State Library is also a very modern library. Um, and we, um, we have lots of digitized resources and provide access to all sorts of electronic media. 
Um, so uh, what really matters to us is content. And we are not really interested in, in the media. So if it was books or if it is uh, a petabyte or if it is on the palimpsest or so, we, we collect that, you see. And um, so storage of course matters. We are an archival library, so we have to expand the storages but we also expand our electronic resources. We have in actually the, the largest equipment um, for uh, scanning devices and so on for all German cultural institutions. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm working uh, mostly with academic libraries. So I'm, we knew uh, for engineering um, technology materials is already existing in electronic format, which is much easier um, to be distributed or accessed by our uh, uh, audience. But also uh, because of uh, higher education, we need to have a general um, general education. We need to teach people a lot of uh, broad, much broad knowledge uh, scope. So we still collect um, printing materials for history, for uh, humanity, uh, for lots of things. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, the readers come to the library just broad things, you don't purposely try to find something to read, they just sit down, open a book, start to uh, thinking about uh, their, their things. And I think that's the most important feature of the library. Uh, it's not to give you something you want, but to guide you or somehow let you to uh, freely explore in the intellectual uh, world. So um, yeah, it is difficult to buy a printing materials these days, you know, cost, transportation, storage, all the things, but we're still uh, doing this, yes. Thank you. We're getting very close to our lunch break. Is there any last quick question? Okay, so, oh yes, Marion. It's the sheer size of your libraries in, in China. I'm just in awe. I can't imagine what, um, we have Bunnings over here, which is no comparison in terms of floor space, but it's like 40 Bunnings in one place, a library. So it just sort of blows me away a little bit in terms of the sheer scale and what that actually does for the environment and the importance of all of those things that all of the speakers have spoken about. It's just a comment, so. I think this is a very good question. Actually, actually it's ongoing um, problems in my mind. Um, so when we have more space, we have the more seating tables. And uh, sometimes students really do not come to the library anymore because they can read things you know, electronically at home, at classroom, at other places. So it's become a game to attract people coming to the space. So in, in that regards, if uh, you have more space, you can have a different setting of the different, you know, sometimes with sofa, sometimes with uh, free furniture, some place with uh, more engaging discussion. So we are thinking about uh, buying lots of uh, um, technology so that people can come to a place to sharing what they knew, what they got. So uh, for example, um, in some kind of uh, um, discussion room, People can sharing their different computers to exchange information just between computers. You don't need to FTP, you don't need to email things. They can click and you suddenly things appear on the computer screen. You know, this kind of technology to uh, speed up intellectual discussion. So that also requires equipment, uh, special furniture, uh, networking settings, etc. But it gives us more opportunities to use the space for different settings for our users. Thank you both so much. Sorry, can I just ask one question? Janet, yes. I can go a bit too No. I have also just a question around that, sort of related to that. Did you say that it is a requirement that all libraries have to yeah, provide one quarter of the total for university libraries? So that is a sort of a legal thing. Yes. So let's guarantee the minimum space we will. And does that apply to the campus library that they might be within a university? Campus library. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, only campus, yes, it's, it's for the library for the university. Yeah. As okay. part of the teaching facility. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, I have one thing to supplement your materials question. I think it's very good. 
what Shanghai Lab is, they, that's one uh, issue is when or you design, you see the beautiful buildings. The outside fitting is marble rock, marble stone. And it, it, it has one, two problems. One is can kind of get the materials from outside, too many and too heavy, too expensive. Also environment issues, you know, you, if you're using lots of stone, you, you destroy the other place environment. So this is something very smart. They're using a printing glass. So you, you saw that it's printing on the glass, it looks like marble, but it's not. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's much economic and yeah. also environment green library. Yeah. 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 Mm. I think that's that's fascinating. Great. It's great to hear your questions. And I know seating in university libraries is a, is a big issue, isn't it? But we're really fascinated to hear all your questions and equally fascinated to hear your um, insightful answers, Dorothea and Foster. Um, and just before you go, we've got a little something for you. Oh, goodies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, before I give you the lunch housekeeping messages, I'd like to do another special thank you. Um, in addition to our commercial sponsors today, we had another very special sponsor, which was the State Library of New South Wales. Um, thank you. Uh, what our State Library colleagues did, and thank you, Cameron, for organising that, is to um, sponsor some seats so some of our public library colleagues across the state um, could could have um, a ticket here today. So um, lovely to have you here, State Library people, but also thank you for enabling other people to get here too. That's absolutely wonderful. And um, I hope you're all enjoying it. Mm -hmm.